Okay, I think let's uh, get started. I'm sure we'll have a few more people that join us. But uh, my name is Letha McLaren, and I am the CEO and the co-founder of Learnfully. We're an online personalized learning platform for struggling students and parents. Uh, and today we're here to talk about a topic that a lot of parents struggle with, which is uh, how what to do in the summertime to avoid the summer slide. Me as a parent, uh, I've always uh, found this a little bit as a dilemma with my own son. Obviously, I want to, my son to enjoy the summertime and have a nice break, but at the same time, I don't want to uh, lose the momentum and the gains that he made during the school year. And so uh, that's what we're going to talk about today is really some tips and some strategies to avoid that summer slide. To guide us through the conversation today, we have uh, Jess Corinne. She's the head of educational services for Learnfully. Um, she's going to do about a half an hour presentation, and then we'll have some time, some, some time set aside for Q&A. Um, you'll see at the bottom of the Zoom link, there's a Q&A little uh, message button. Feel free to just type in any messages as we go through the content, and I'll keep track of those. And then um, either I'll interrupt her or I'll just wait to the end, and, uh, and then we'll have a, a little bit of Q&A at the end. All right, Jess, take it away. Thanks, Letha. I am so excited to be here. Thank you all for joining us. As she said, I am the head of educational services. I started my educational career as a K-1 teacher. I was excited and eager to dive into the classroom and apply everything that I learned in college. Shortly thereafter, I was faced with disappointment when I realized that I wasn't fully equipped and that I really didn't have the training and understanding to reach each and every learner on an individualized basis as they needed and deserved. So I started with Lindy Mood Bell learning processes and I embarked in the journey to learn multi-sensory evidence-based methodologies. I was a clinician in their learning center division and then I moved into the consultant role, both in their learning centers and in their school services division. I worked with an after school program in Redwood City, California and I taught the after school teachers how to implement the programs in small group setting. And then I traveled down to a Navajo reservation in Gallup, New Mexico, and I taught to both learners and their families how to read. It was an absolutely incredible experience, one that I cherish and think of daily. It really did set my trajectory in the right direction and seal the deal, so to speak, in terms of what I wanted to dedicate my life to and do. So then I moved back up to the Bay Area and I became a center director. I oversaw the fidelity of implementation in our learning centers in the Bay Area, and I even moved down to Los Angeles for a short while. I then became an executive director and regional manager, where I oversaw the Bay Area, the Pacific Northwest, and Hawaii, which of course had its perks. After Linda Mood Bell, I started my own private practice, and I consulted with several local schools, and we actually still consult with a couple of them through Learnfully, and I consulted with a pediatrician's practice to start their educational programming as well. That then led me to Learnfully, and I am so thrilled and excited and honored to take on the role as head of educational services. Without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into the main event. Oops, sorry about that. So today's agenda, we're doing an introduction overview of Learnfully. I'll provide you with insight into our mission and our programming, the services that we offer. We will also talk about summer slide and give you five fun-filled preventative tips that we as a collaborative team can employ in your summer months to ensure that your learners continue that strong momentum over those two to three months. And then we'll open up the floor for Q&A, discussion and reflection as Letha mentioned. So Learnfully, Learnfully is a resource of highly curated network of educational specialists Essentially, what we find is that our learners are in need of a personalized platform in order for them to reach their full potential. So we start their learning trajectory with us by assessing a learning screener, administering that screener to really assess their present levels as well as their baselines in order for us to generate initial recommendations that in involve multi-sensory evidence-based instruction. Typically speaking, we would look at a learner's profile and then match that learner to a highly skilled educational specialist who has the certification and credentialing in the programming that we feel our learners would best benefit from, as well as their personality. We want to make sure that all of our learners and educational specialists alike are able to establish a really strong rapport 
because connectivity leads to the highest level of results. We're also building out our content platform to ensure that our learners have access to reinforcement materials in, in between their sessions, which is key to keep that momentum going and to expedite progress, of course. And we also pride ourselves as a team of communicators. Um, educational specialists and myself, of course, are a communicative bunch. We provide session notes following each and every session so that our parents and caregivers know firsthand what, how their learner is progressing. And then we host monthly progress update meetings to ensure that you have the opportunity mm -hmm. to see the progress firsthand. Um, and then of course, to ensure that we're also on track and that we're matching in terms of our short and long-term goals for your learner. Learnfully and learning is a multi-sensory experience. There is a plethora of, of evidence to substantiate the notion that learning must be done in a sensory based format. And so these are our three core senses. Now, respectfully, we recognize that there are seven different learning styles that incorporate these three and, and beyond senses. Uh, these are the three core senses that the, the majority of our programming envelops in order to secure implementation and maintain fidelity. The auditory component, those auditory learners or the programming that involves the auditory side of the spectrum, it really involves things like oral exams, discussions, audiobooks, podcasts. Um, also an auditory learner is one who likes to, to uh, spell aloud so they can really hold on to those words that they heard. A visual learner or the visual component of our programming also involves any visual materials in order for the learner to take that screenshot or that snapshot with their brain in order to tap into that visual at a later date uh, to recall and retain information. Visual learners do best by accessing and, and being engaged through graphics, charts, um, videos, and so forth. The kinesthetic learner or the kinesthetic aspect of our programming, are, they're really the movers and the shakers. They are project-based learners, they're hands-on. They're typically those learners that need more movement and sensory breaks throughout their instructional periods. And we ensure that we provide that in order to keep all of our learners engaged, not just those kinesthetic learners. The subcomponents of the learning process are absolutely key to keep in mind. We're talking through the fundamental skills that need to be in place and continue to be built upon in order for our learners to feel confident and successful in the fall. Alan Pavio developed the dual coding theory in 1971. And that theory states that we take in information, whether it be oral or written, and we translate that information into a way that's imagery rich. And all that means is whatever you hear or whatever you see, you're actually sometimes inherently without having the cognizance that you're actually translating those into images in your mind's eye. Those mental representations can take two forms. One is a static form where you're imprinting numbers, letters, patterns, symbols, much like the letters as to how to spell the words in front of you. And then the dynamic, the flip side is that dynamic imagery where you're picturing the concept or the meaning behind the word. The dynamic image is based on the activation of prior experience. So for example, your car might look much different in your mind's eye than my car. And so your expressive language is what allows the learner to really build and conjure that image to match what you're picturing as well. Without these two forms of imagery deeply embedded into our mind's eye and without a heightened cognizance as to these two forms of mental representations, it's really difficult to succeed beyond memorization in the classroom. So we'll discuss this a little bit further on too. So what is summer slide? Let's dive into it. Summer slide is simply the learning loss that occurs over the summer months. When learners are not necessarily exposed to learning opportunities throughout the summer, they tend to backslide and regress the number of months that they're out of school. Now, we fully understand that learners need that decompression, that relaxation time for one or two weeks after school it ends, but we wanna make sure that your learners actually have opportunities to sprinkle in those, those moments of, of critical thinking and problem solving. And we'll talk about how you can do so without, without adding too much to your schedule in order for your learners to continue to feel confident and successful throughout the summer and then into the next year. 
As you can imagine, learning loss impacts more than just academics. It has a, a drastic impact on our social emotional well being. And so when a learner enters the classroom without having these opportunities of, of learning throughout the summer, we actually see them regress in terms of their self-esteem and self-confidence. They're not as excited and enthusiastic to jump into the school year. They might be excited to see their friends, but that is short-lived. Then thus, they aren't able to take initiative or take risks. And through that initiative, through that leaning into discomfort, we tend to see um, our learners really be able to flex their mindset and take advantage of all the learning experiences that are available to them. Stamina and frustration thresholds are much lower if we don't build in some structure and sprinkle in the learning opportunities throughout the summer months as well. As you can imagine, I'm sure as you've experienced as caregivers, there has been quite an influx of anxiety in both the family dynamic and the school environment. Um, we recently discovered that 75% of caregivers are reporting that there has been an escalation of anxiety, both internally for them and in their learners. I also recently, just this morning, read an article about chronic stress and how this unprecedented time, since it's not so short lived, has extended and started wearing away at not just our, our mental health and emotional well being, but our biological health as well. And so here at Learnfully, we wanna ensure that we can remove any unnecessary stress in your life by being a consultant, a coach, um, someone to lean on as support because we don't need to create any unnecessary or added levels of anxiety in both the, the caregiver's perspective, but also in our learner's perspective. So we're trying to alleviate that anxiety as best we can by giving that extra boost throughout the summer months so they can approach fall with feelings of security as well as feelings of success. With or without the, the pandemic, this is tried and true. No matter what, even, even without this unprecedented time, we often see that learners backside two to three months worth over the summer months. And even just looking at neuroplasticity, which is your brain's ability to mold and reconnect the activity in your brain, we see that it takes two months even just to get into the routine, to reactivate the brain waves that are responsible for cognition, executive functioning, language processing skills. So even if our teacher spends, let's say on average three weeks reviewing the prior, the prior year's material, it actually takes two to three months, social, emotionally, and academically for your learner to feel secure in the, in the next grade in the classroom. So we wanna make sure that we're providing any and all opportunities to prevent this from happening. Um, and so we're gonna go ahead and talk about ways that we can do that. So let's talk about the five steps to summer success. The first step, and I think one of the most important is to make sure that we're bringing in the fun factor. We're engaging learning in a very fun filled way and you can do that organically in and out of the household. We also want to continue to build the learning foundations that I briefed you on earlier in the presentation and I'll continue to talk to in momentarily. It's important to continue that strong framework for them to stand upon when they enter the classroom again next year. We want to introduce a new skill. This is super fun. I get jealous every time I talk about this. We want to make sure we're exposing those, all of our learners to those maybe interests and skills that they weren't able to, to work on throughout the school year because of limited time and give them the opportunity to do so. Encouraging boredom. I mean, this is, I know, far-fetched to think of, but we've been in a state of boredom. I think I'm, I'm also jealous about this, but I think, you know, for our learners, they've been, they've been in a state of boredom for some time, but with boredom comes beauty. And so we want to talk through some ways that you can sprinkle in boredom to your day to, in order to encourage creativity and imagination in our learners. And then finally, we want to invest in the right screen time. We know that we're going to provide some structure throughout the summer months in order to keep the structure momentum alive. Um, and this can be another way that you do so to avoid the screen burnout that we're seeing in our learners these days. Okay, so how to make it fun. I want you to think about these questions as I'm talking through these slides. Really, what makes your learner tick? What are their strengths? What are their interests? What are some areas that we can strengthen or that have been particularly challenging? And what are some engaging aspects of that experience for them? 
How can we use their free time? And in summer, there's quite a bit of it. How can we use the free time to, to pepper in experiences that really re-engage them in the fun-filled nature of learning so that they enjoy learning for learning and not as a task or as a chore? So camps, we're unsure, it depends on your area. We are an international organization. So I know this varies from state to state, country to country. Um, but essentially what we're finding is that some camps are going to host mini camps or pods in small group settings, which will provide an opportunity for your learners to collaborate with their peers, continue to strengthen their socialization and their social skills, and all the while engage in communication and experiences that can keep their brain stimulated. With camping comes a little balance, of course. There's opportunities where you can find interest-based camps that we'll talk about in a moment. But I think it's a really thrilling opportunity to just even imagine the idea of our learners going back to camp this summer. Brain games. So I don't actually call brain games brain games in my household um, because I'm teacher mom and believe it or not, my kids, much like I'm sure you can relate, um, are not exactly thrilled to work with me on their learning goals, not in the summer or otherwise. Um, so we have a cabinet that we have board games, card games, um, all readily available so they can access them at any time. They can play games individually together as siblings in their pod or their small group, um, or also part of your family time. And we don't necessarily have to tell them that we're pulling their brain drain and making it brain gain. Um, it just organically happens and it's it, they're having fun and are engaged at the same time. So continuing to build learning foundations is our second step. And this is critical for especially those learners who are in the beginning emerging stage, stages of elementary education, but also those learners who have a disparity between their performance and their full potential. We don't necessarily wanna put this burden on you as the caregiver. And so this is where you can absolutely exercise external resources to support this ability to continue strengthening those underlying abilities in order for them to feel secure to apply those skills and continue to build those neural connections as they, as they skyrocket into the, final, the next year. Um, so these areas that we want to target are critical thinking skills, executive functioning, making sure your learners feel secure with their reading skills, whether it be the baseline of decoding or phonemic awareness, as well as contextual reading and comprehension. So there are fun ways that you can do this on an organic way at home, but we need, for these learners at least, we need to explicitly teach them the strategies and through repetition and consistency, rebuild some of those areas in their brain that are responsible for processing language in and out of the classroom. Got to switch it up, right? I think we all agree for as, as adults, but especially for kids to maintain engagement and sustain their attention, we need to diversify their experiences. So for example, you might send your child to a camp in the morning and then schedule some instructional sessions over the afternoon hours in order to maintain and, and their gains from last year and then further build on the foundation that they've established. Ooh, these are two key facts that I like to keep near and dear to my heart as teacher mom. Uh, essentially, we need to ensure that our learners understand the notion that it's not about content and curriculum per se, it's really teaching them how to think. It's not about teaching them how to pass the test in the new school year, but more so how they can pass the test of life. And so by strengthening these underlying sensory cognitive functions, it really helps our learners flex their mindset, absorb new material, of course, but really expand their thinking in a way that teaches them how to use their higher order thinking skills, retain, reflect, discuss, and really embrace the learning that is to come instead of pushing back on it and facing it with resentment because they're focused on memorizing a ton of math facts or they're memorizing historical facts, let's say. You have to find what works. I know as a parent, this can be very overwhelming. There's a ton of materials out there. And quite frankly, the bookstores, are, for the most part, aren't necessarily open for you to go through and peruse. But I would look online for samples and I would contact us to support you in this process as well, because we acknowledge that this can be overwhelming to find materials that can continue their momentum throughout the summer. 
Some learners actually don't do well with workbooks too, and we acknowledge that, whether it be because they're fine motor skills or, or even just the pure nature of the, of the page and of the content on the page. Um, but we want to ensure that our learners in between our instructional sessions have reinforcement. And so we typically, if you were to, to embark in a journey with us, we typically recommend a, a few games in between our sessions or a little bit of reading time to make sure that we're continuing to build upon that strong foundation and we're expediting progress all along the way. So please don't feel overwhelmed by this slide. There are many materials out there and we can help you find what works for your learner based on their learning profile and their present levels. All right, let's introduce something new. This is super fun too. I get excited to think of what would I do if given the time. And this is a fun discussion to have at the dinner table. If you had the opportunity to learn a new skill or to develop a new hobby or habit even, what would you do? Uh, this can be individualized. This can take form in small group or during family time, whatever we feel is, is the best fit for your learner. Um, or it can even be something not necessarily new, but an interest that they've, they've shown over the course of the year that they didn't have a ton of time to mold and nurture. So some examples of that would be hobbies in the form of camps or classes. You can take like, for example, my daughter loves to code. And so you can take a coding or a game design class. My son is always busting a move throughout the house. And so we're gonna enroll him in some dance classes this summer, he's something he's never done before. And so not only is this expanding their interest base and really bolstering their strengths, but it's actually improving their cognitive skills because it's really tapping into and strengthening those areas of the brain that are responsible for flexible thinking, for new connections, for collaborating and making new friends, for critical thinking skills and really concentration and focus because they're, they're having to engage in something that they find interesting and fun, but still working on those pathways in the brain at the same time. Ah, oh, I'm so jealous of this. Aren't you all caregivers? <laughs> and wouldn't we love the idea of being bored one day? Um, quite the opposite in this household, at least. So encouraging boredom is really important. And I know sometimes for us parents, it can be really uncomfortable to see your child sitting around doing nothing. And of course, the first few weeks, like I said, and maybe even the last few weeks of summer, we want to give them some time off just to veg. Um, but this is different. This is building in boredom to your schedule. Because with boredom, comes beauty. And a lot of the times we see that learners, when they're bored, that's when their imagination lights up. That's when we see their creative channels running and juiced. And so we want to make sure that we're giving them this in a structured way, but giving them a chance to really dive into that level of boredom so that they can stretch their thinking, their interests, and explore areas and, and strengths that they might not otherwise. Structure is key. As I mentioned, we got to build in boredom to our schedule. There's a reason for that, you know, especially in the times of this, of the pandemic and the escalation of anxiety, both in and out of the household, structure really creates routine and stability. We know when our learners and our caregivers, frankly, feel safe and secure, that they're much more willing to kind of dive in into the learning process and they're much, much more likely to retain the learning that takes place if they feel a level of calm and security. And so by, by continuing the structure that you've established throughout the school year, you're really allowing your learner to open up their mind to the possibility of learning so that they are prepared and receptive to even take in all of this learning that you're sprinkling in throughout their day. Research shows that it takes at least two to three hours per week of explicit teaching to continue the momentum from the last year to the, to the following year. Now, these are, this is not necessarily to say that if you have a learner who has missed a milestone, has, is struggling to learn in a certain capacity, that they just need two hours a week to catch up. We're just saying two to three hours per week is needed for them to, to continue to play on that level playing field. This is where we come in at Learnfully. We want to make sure that we're here to support you with our Rise and Shine summer program to explicitly teach the content and standards that were that they were taught earlier on in the school year, and then to continue to reinforce those throughout the summer, as well as preview and front load the content and standards that they'll face early on in the following year. 
So again, they can lean into discomfort, they can dive into the classroom and feel very secure and confident at the same time. This is a sample plan. Please don't feel like you have to adopt it. This is just teacher mom coming from a, the two parent working household who has four children herself. This is how I keep us accountable to learning goals throughout the summer months. And I chisel away a little bit and making sure our family maintains their organizational skills and their executive functioning. It's motivating, it's visual, super simple. Again, you don't need to use the system, but I even find writing the daily schedule on a chalkboard or, or drawing pictures for what's to come throughout the week is really helpful to provide that structure and security that our learners need to be responsive and, and open to the learning process. Investing in the right screen time. I think we all can agree that at least those of us who have continued on in distance learning, that a lot of our learners are facing or are about to face screen time burnout. And so as best we can, we'd like to prevent that and really lean back on the idea that screen time is beneficial for the learning trajectory and is not necessarily all about vegging out, although decompression is needed sometimes, but we don't want to necessarily tap them out on screen time when we know there's some valuable technological and educational resources that they can access if done so in a balanced way. We suggest that you access reading kids blogs or listening to podcasts, playing some of those brain games, and I'll show you some examples in a moment. Um, and all the while you're doing so, you're, you're talking, you're discussing, you're Socratically questioning, just like our educational specialists would do in our session. We are briefing a subject or talking about something that interests your learner. And then we're taking a step back and using that Socratic line or open-ended line of questioning not only to really exercise their critical thinking skills, but also to really train them on how to be resourceful and ask the right questions. Ah, here's some stellar games and apps that we all, we all enjoy in my household at least, and I'm sure you can think of plenty more. Um, BrainZ or educational.com is what you see in the far corner. That is a resource for educators primarily, but they also have really fun games. And we usually recommend, we'll create a profile for our learners that learn fully. And we usually will assign some games that they can play in their off time just to keep the learning alive. Kahoot is a multiple choice quiz game that each of my family members will take their own device and go in a different room. And there's, I'm telling you, a multiplicity of subject matters. So you can find anywhere from dogs to a country, to a holiday, to any specific event or novel. We use this a lot in our novel studies in our sessions. It's just a really fun, interactive, engaging way to, to quiz each other. Minecraft, believe it or not, has been proven as has Tetris and Pac-Man to really continue wiring the brain and the neural pathways that are responsible for creative problem solving and imagination. Um, and they can, it can be done collaboratively too. So there's a socialization aspect there. And Heads Up is kind of like that headbands game, but it's online. It's a really fun way to build one's visual image based on questioning and train your learner how to ask the right questions in order for them to create those same mental representations. There's a kid's version. And for all of these, as well as board games and card games, there's junior versions too. So it doesn't matter what age your learner is, they can access this no matter what. Ah, so how do we get to the, the path of potential? There are three steps. These first three steps are how we kind of engage your learner in the learning process with our educational specialists. First and foremost, we like to get the caregiver's perspective on how their learner is progressing or not progressing in the classroom and beyond. So we start with an intake discussion where we either have a phone call or a Zoom call, give you an opportunity to share your learner's narrative, and then of course, we might ask questions to clarify how they're progressing and how if they are or are not meeting their goals. We can also at this stage conduct a file review where we look at any previous reports, report cards, work samples, whatever you feel comfortable sharing, we are more than happy to take a look at because your perspective of course contributes to our recommendations and our learning plan. Next, we schedule a learner screener where we can really pinpoint where the breakdown might be happening in a learner's trajectory. It takes about two hours to administer our learning abilities assessments online. And at that point, we're able to analyze both the caregiver's questionnaire and the screener results in order to establish both short and long-term goals. 
In our consultation, we review our findings and we propose an initial recommendation plan that is based on interests, strengths, and those areas that we want to improve. At the same time, we're matching you with an educational specialist who has both the certification and the personality that they need to really connect with your learner in order to help them progress and feel successful both during the summer and throughout the school year. We have a three-tier approach to our summer programming. The first tier is intensive remediation. We typically recommend this to be implemented on an individualized basis, so usually one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one if appropriate. The goal is to strengthen that foundation for how they learn, and we do so through multiplicity of multi-sensory evidence-based programs, depending on your learner's style, profile, and needs. Some of those programs involve Orton-Gillingham and Wilson Reading System. We also use zones of self-regulation and visualizing and verbalizing. To say, I mean, there are so many more, but that's just a snippet of what we have in store for your learner if they're in need of intensive remediation. Enrichment is really where we target a specific skill. So a learner might start the summer with us doing intensive remediation and then shift into one of these two other programs. If they don't need intensive remediation, they might bypass that and then shift into either enrichment or our rise and shine summer boost. Enrichment, like I said, is targeting a specific skill. So an example of this could be a writing, step up to writing workshop where we might have one or two hours per week dedicated explicitly to teaching our learners in a variety of grades, how to construct a paragraph, how to color code their writing, how to speak in a way that represents that visual image that we discussed, how to peer and self edit, the list goes on. Um, but there are several where we have a few enrichment workshops in the, in the works. Um, so feel free to reach out and ask us what that will entail. Rise and Shine is our, is our preventative summer slide summer boost. And so typically learners will see us for one of the first two and then they'll transition to the summer boost where we're reviewing the previous year's content and standards. And then we're also front loading and previewing next year's standards. And this can usually, usually be implemented in a group format. So you also have the socialization and collaboration that we know is also important for our learners, especially over the summer months. That does it for us. I am so thankful to have this opportunity to present to you and, and open up the floor for questions and answers. Don't, don't forget to contact us and sign up for a screener so we can really pinpoint what program would be best for your learner. I'm gonna turn the mic over to Lisa for any Q&A that we might find is necessary. I'm happy to answer those questions. And again, if we don't answer all of your questions now, we will circle back and make sure that your answers are, are you receive the answers that you need. Excellent, great. So um, maybe the, for the first question, Jess, um, you mentioned this a little bit in, in one of your slides, um, just talking about burnout. What if, you know, parents have uh, kids who either they just feel like there's a lot of screen time burnout, or maybe they, they just feel like they are better in, uh, for in-person instruction? What do you think? That's a great question. I think it's imperative to keep this in mind. And as I mentioned, screen burnout is legit. It's alive and well. We're feeling it as adults just as much as the kids are. Um, so for our learners, we really want to make sure that we're heightening engagement in every virtual opportunity. I think that's key. And so not just for those kinesthetic learners, for all learners, we need to incorporate movement breaks, sensory breaks, some of those brain games and interests to ensure that they're bought into the process and they feel engaged. We also can, can determine the number of hours or the time per day that we see your learner based on their level of engagement and their sustained attention. We, as I mentioned, we have the enrichment and the rise and shine programs. And those are, those are valid opportunities to incorporate a, a pod or a group or you know, a small setting to ensure that our learners have some collaborative aspect, even if it's online. I think it's important to note that they'll have the opportunity to feel engaged and connected in these short stints of time. Um, we also wanna make sure that we note that we have a possibility of opening in-person learning camps throughout the summer that will provide intensive enrichment and boost instruction. So those learning centers may open, it's just based on interest. If we find that your learner does best and is most receptive to the in-person style of implementation, then we can absolutely exercise that as an option. 
great. And then you mentioned pods or grouping kids together. How do you group, um, you know, different students together? Great question. Um, I think, you know, that, that idea of connectivity with the educational specialist and learner is just as true when you're constructing a group or a pod for your learners. And so this happens all the time, you know, for camps and such, they just throw a big group of kids in. And of course they learn how to problem solve and, and connect that way. But I think we have the valuable opportunity and the privilege to be able to meet your learners in advance, provide the screening results, really get to know them in a, in a real way so we can build groups and pods that involve similar interests and of course, similar strengths and areas that need improvement because we all wanna be on the same trajectory and ensure that we all feel supported. So a lot of our groups are about the same age. They gen generally have the same interests and the same level of recommendations so that our learners can feel like they're part of a community. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Um, maybe talk a little bit about the transition from summer into fall. What can parents expect um, from this transition process? Oh, certainly. So we have all of this valuable learning experience time together over the summer. And then what happens, right? Typically what we see is that our learners will go from an intensive or enrichment phase over the summer months. And then we will help them generalize and carry over their skills into the fall months by reducing the number of hours per week that we support your family and your learners. And so we'll work on all these underlying skills, build a super strong foundation. And then of course, we will help them carry over their skills into an application phase where we're seeing them a couple days a week. We'll still continue to build that foundation and strengthen the skills. All the while, we might also help them plan their time, feel oriented, right? With their executive functioning and their planners. We might sprinkle in some school oriented homework based tasks as well to make sure they see the impact and see how everything they worked on this summer applies in a way that makes them feel successful and confident within those sessions. So we'll start with the summer program and then we'll generalize those skills into a, a less intensive format over the fall so that we can support the transition. Yeah, good, makes a lot of sense. What about, maybe you could talk a little bit about the specialist network, uh, specifically about the specialists. What kind of qualifications do they have? What can parents expect from, this, from this, these specialists? Oh, most certainly. So as I mentioned, we have a highly created network of specialists. I am I'm so fortunate and proud to say that all of our educational specialists have at least a master's degree and they have certification and credentialing in more than one multi-sensory evidence-based program. They also have the personality, the dynamics and the experience in order to really keep a learner engaged online. So all of them have experience five to 20 years, some of them have the experience implementing instruction in a virtual format so that they can maintain engagement and really enhance and sustain attention. They also have that fun filled enthusiastic personality to meet the same goals. So not only are they certified and credentialed, but they also have experience in engaging learners online through the fun factor and through their experience as a virtual learning or educational specialist. It's fantastic. Well, we would like to thank you uh, for joining us today um, on this topic of the summer slide. We know it's very top of mind, especially as we approach the end of the school year. And, and right now is the time where parents are really trying to figure out what to do with the summertime. Uh, and so thank you very much, Jess. It's a great thank presentation. You. We will um, provide the, uh, a recording of the session uh, afterwards, because I think uh, maybe there's a few people also who didn't, weren't able to attend. So we'll make sure to send out an email and make the, the webinar available. Thank you very much, Jess. Absolutely, thank you. And thank you for attending.